Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, please, can you see this slide? All the blame is to Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I welcome everyone to yet another lecture series, um, which we normally organize uh, twice in a month at least. Uh, so we are coming to International Student of Islam Psychology, Nigerian chapter. Uh, today's lecture is about um, the myth of normal dysfunctional patterns within Muslim families by our lecturer, Star Amina Yunus Ali. This lecture, um, usually our lectures are focused on mental health issues and psychology, Islam psychology, so say, or let me say, uh, Islamic epistemology sense of it. Um, you are going to agree with me that parenting Necessarily and family issues uh, uh, play a vital role in terms of mental health. Of course, how, how we think, how we conduct ourselves in life, it's all start from home, as uh, your body used to say, that this, all this training actually start from home and it reflects on how um, our life or how we conduct our life and how we see how our worldview generally. Our, our background is very important. So this particular topic is, I would say, very, very important to psychology, Islamic psychology especially. Uh, so we can't wait to, uh, to listen to our lecturer to share our wisdom uh, and our experience regarding this particular topic. Now I'm just, Bismillah uh, Rahman Rahim. So our agenda is uh, quite straightforward. Uh, we'll be having, uh, a quick dua and opening prayer. So which we are going to stay together. And usually we recite so much, but as a means of opening. So I will start now. I will be live in Shaitan Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm al-Din. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina as-sirat al-mustakim. As-sirat al-lazina an-namta alayhim. Ghayr al-magdubi alayhim wa al-talim. Amen. So these are just the quick guidelines. Uh, I will read them, and after that, I will ask uh, one of our uh, organizers to please read out the profile of our lecturer. And after then, afterwards, uh, Sister Mina will proceed with the lecture, and we will have the question and answer. In between, I mean, and before the question and answer, we will have a recap of the lecture, and afterwards uh, there will be a closing question. I will pray Allah makes this possible and make this. Uh, session beneficial to every one of us, the community and on individual level. So yeah, that's basic rules you can put on your camera and um, just be careful of how you conduct yourself probably because it, this recording might be in the gallery view. So, uh, you know, if you're not well dressed or you're not having a good, uh, it's always good to have uh, so that when this goes online, uh, you also be proud of how you look look like so you have be recording and uh, so there is no need for you to record and this can be shared later uh, hopefully after the lecture we're going to put it on youtube so please uh while the lecture is on keep your uh, mic muted uh you don't need to speak or interrupt uh if you notice there's a mistake you can quickly mute it uh you can utilize the chat button to send your questions and if you wish to to make it verbal after the lecture you can raise up your hand using a digital uh, sign to raise up your hand and you'll be allowed to speak, inshallah. So you can also put on the transcription if you want. You go to the settings and you can request for that, inshallah. So I want to quickly tell you a little bit about uh, International Student of Islamic Psychology. It's an inclusive space designed to connect people with diverse backgrounds interested in Islamic psychology. This, you know, Islamic psychology is a uh, it's more like a movement now, uh, as uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's obvious that there is a need for professionals, even in the field, know that there is a need to, for inclusiveness of uh, traditional, um, you know, psychology as we know it. It's more, when we come to say, uh, they, they don't discuss the vital elements of soul, in that sense of it. And so uh, there's a big gap. and. It's now becoming like a movement that there is a need 
to review this because even the practitioners are not, they, they admit that there are some areas that they cannot fulfill uh, some, some of the needs of their patient because of the limits that uh, the modern the psychology uh, gave. So the aim is to disseminate knowledge, share resources, uh, and discuss best practices in a free and accessible manner. So this, this is the goal of International Center of Science Psychology. It's a platform to enable further development of people, personal and professional interests, studies and understanding of Islamic psychology within their communities and all countries of origin. So we do a lot of uh, projects and partners with other professional organizations in relating to mental health uh, uh, projects. Now, uh, just as currently we are part of, the international body is part of those organizing the, there is a inaugural at uh, HKBU University, organizing a conference on, as they are currently try, trying to start up a Islamic psychology masters at masters level, and they are looking out how uh, to get in a conference on how the best practice for 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 that uh, for the new program they are going to start. So ISIP is one of the organizers of that, event. So, something of that, that nature, and lots of MOU here and there just to ensure that there is um, increased awareness of Islamic psychology as, uh, as we have it now. So you can, to know more about us, you can join this, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, you can join the WhatsApp group, so many of them, and we're gonna share one of them with you. You can join that of Nigeria for you to get updates of Nigerian activities. We have lots of initiatives that are currently going on and that we are about to, uh, initiate inshallah and we'll be glad to have lots of people what we want to have uh, people who like to volunteer and who are interested to know more about Islamic psychology especially in nigeria because we discover that the awareness is very low even at the academic level so uh, you know it's more like catching and young so when we get undergraduate students and even research students that will be interested in having or doing some research in Islamic psychology so we're we'll glad to work uh, together with them uh, so you can also become a member uh, by going to the website and you can get access to the Visa Library. There you have lots of resources to guide you on what Islamic psychology is all about, inshallah. So if you want to join the international, there is Islamic psychology resource group where people share all sort of resources relating to Islamic psychology. Uh, so you can join it. This is at international level. And also we have the Nigerian chapter group that I'm going to paste the link on the uh, on the chat box so that we can, if you're interested, you can join, uh, you can join in the show. <clears throat> so now we'll just invite uh, one of our organizers, Sister Atifa, to please read the profile of our lecturer. Uh, please go ahead, Sister Atifa. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay. Um... Sister Amina Oluwatosun Yunus Ali is a certified family, family therapist, performance consultant, results coach, and master practitioner of neuro linguistic programming. She specializes in, utilize, in using therapeutic tools to help clients identify and heal unresolved childhood traumas and psychological barriers affecting their well being. Her career began in 2003, focusing on guiding adolescents towards health, healthy self-esteem and vision setting. Amina has curated programs for youth and young adults, including the Future Leaders Project and the Emerging Leaders Project. With expertise in family systems and engineer and family systems engineering and family mediation. Amina combines various methodologies to provide invigorating and successful family therapy and coaching. She utilizes research-based tools from organizations like the Gottman Institute and employs intermediate level tapping meditation techniques to restore family relationships. Amina's focus has shifted towards nurturing family connections, fostering resilience, and honoring individual uniqueness. She has impacted families and individuals across multiple countries through therapy, coaching, seminars, and creative workshops. 
Amina is involved in several organizations and serves as a member of the Board of Trustees slash Executive. Her coaching firm, Timeless Soul Incorporated, offers therapeutic programs designed to help families appreciate their uniqueness while navigating growth and individuality. Programs include Encounter Me, Encounter Us, Teen Transition Therapy, and Value Integration Program. The firm also assists individuals in recovering from adverse childhood experiences and identifying their path through trauma recovery processes. Amina's firm provides various services, including parenting mediation, consultation for schools, um, for schools setting up counseling units, and emotional impact assessment for teachers. Over the last three years, Timeless, Timeless So Incorporated has assisted um, other firms in the family industry in developing unique structures and coaching pathways for client recovery processes. Amina is recognized in the family life coaching industry for her value-driven approach using science-based methods delivered with compassion, compassion and tact. She is also an author and enjoys reading, writing, and traveling. Welcome, our lecturer. Thank you very much, Jazakumbah Heron. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa everyone. Thank you for having me here. Okay, so I think I'll just go on ahead, right? <clears throat> Um, once again, just my heaven for um having me over here to talk about um one of the many things that is uh, that I'm passionate about, actually talking about Muslim families. Um, the topic is the myths of normal, and we're talking about the dysfunctional patterns within Muslim families. Understanding that we know that there are certain things that are expected of us as Muslims and Muslima, but at the moment we become a family unit the expect expectation begins to impact the society as a whole. Um, on this slide, there are three facts, three truths, and one question mark. So I'm gonna read each one of them out. And in the, and in the comment section in the, in the chat box, you could just tell me which one you believe by saying one or two or three or four, which one you believe is the question mark. So the first one, number one, it says the family is the most important part of the society. Do you need this is do you think this is the truth or this is the question mark? The second question, the society reflects the, the realities of the family. The society reflects the realities of the family. Is this the truth or the question mark? The third statement, the Muslim family model for an effective society. Will this be the truth or the question mark? I'm waiting for your answer in the comment section, yeah? And then the last one, number four, Islam provides a clear constitution for establishing a model family. Is this the truth or the question mark? So I'll be here reading, just giving us a pause. Okay, Dr. Mamou Mishore says number four, um, Someone here says the first question, the family is the most important part of the society. And then the question, so I'm, I'm wondering, do you mean that the first and the second question are the question mark, right? So I'm waiting for Sister Fauza B. Alimi says question number three. Sister Fauzia says one is the question mark, okay. The third question, the Muslim family is the most for an effective society. Okay. So I have Wafa says three, order says three. Um, third question, third is the question mark. Okay, mashallah, mashallah. Thank you all for responding. Thank you all for responding. The very fact that we begin to question and reflect on this. Now, I'm not gonna tell you the answer to this, um, the answer to this slide until the last, um, until I'm done with my, question because I want you to reflect with me. The, fact, um, the reality of our world is that we expect so much 
from being Muslim. And one of the expectations as Muslim is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah al Rum, verse 21, that among the signs is that he has created for us, made from ourselves. He made mention of two important conditions, two important presuppositions, two important realities or aspirations that we have to strive towards. And that is that he has already put between us love and mercy in our hearts so that we may dwell in tranquility among ourselves. Now, in this are signs for those who reflect. The question here is how often do we reflect about the presence of this love, the Muwadda and the Wahmada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already placed for us? Or how often do we actually think about using these two tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with to effectively live together in tranquility among ourselves? How often do we find families now, whether Muslim or not, such that even amongst themselves, with all the knowledge, with all the exposure that we have, with all the experiences of how our parents did it, that we wanted to do it differently, we still end up um, procreating the trauma of the past, we doing the same mistakes that our, some of our parents and our ancestors actually made. Or, we, or even making new mistakes as a result of our so-called exposure. So the question is again, knowing that tranquil is the goal, is the goal of a family, how then does love and how then does love and mercy play its role in the setting up of that family? And that is where the issue of dysfunction comes in. Because the moment we take away dysfunction, and the moment we take away love and mercy from the establishment of the family, that is when dysfunction begins to appear. However, in the myth, so the, um, the topic itself is the myth of normal, but I chose to use the myth of dysfunction. What we've overly, what I've so far seen in my practice is that people are assuming that if it's not broken, you don't get to fix it, right? Oh, it's not as bad as you think. Everything is all fine. We're, we are going to be fine, you know. What I hear so often, even among Muslim clerics, is that why do we need to learn about the family? I mean, our parents didn't have to do that. So why do we need to learn it? Everything you need to learn is in the Quran. And, and I totally agree. However, the and the process with which the Quran and the Sunnah has actually explicitly shared this with us. How often? Do people pay attention? So, uh, inshallah, alhamdulillah, most of us here are students of Islamic psychology or people who have interest in Islamic psychology. And we're going to spend a number of time, a number of years, a number of months or weeks in learning Islamic psychology because we want to understand our soul. I want to understand the soul of the next person who goes to us. And this will inform us focusing on a particular part. The family is and focuses on entirely on our being. Our focus on the family is our existence. You, you were born into a family, you exist from a family in this world, in this dunya. However, we pay very little attention to understanding the intricacies of what truly makes a family unite. We pay very little attention to understanding what are the things that will make those tools that last one tell us place within our heart work for a tranquil family. And so the first myth that is here is that all families are perfect. Or that the myth of dysfunction is that if we are not perfect, then we are dysfunctional. However, the reality is that in fact, it is in our imperfection that we are functional. It is in the acceptance of our imperfection. It is in the acceptance and our striving towards excellence that we actually begin to find um, tranquility. Because the moment you begin to seek perfection, it is the moment you, you begin to dissociate yourself from what makes you human. Because we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has remained perfection to himself. And that is who he is as our Allah. However, as units, as individuals in this world, as people of as people living in this dunya, before you can, before you, you can't even begin to think that you have to be perfect, you have only to strive with Ihsan towards goodness always. And that is the reality that we need to focus on. The second myth here talks about understanding 
um, how visible this function is. So one of the things that we often also get is that, oh, you can easily tell when the family is dysfunctional. But we fail to realize that even the most dysfunctional family are the families that you most likely go to visit very often. They will most likely come to the masjid very often. They will pray their five solar. They would um, do their siyam as they should. They are even if more, um, they are even more active in the society than the functional, um, functional families. Individuals from dysfunctional families even try harder to hide their dysfunction from the world than the people who are functional in the society. So the reality of dysfunction is that it can be subtle and internal. It can be a struggle. And in fact, the society that we live in makes it even more difficult for you to vulnerably share the dysfunction that you are going through, the struggles that you are going through. And some families struggle silently. And it's more so in our society as Muslims because again, the tranquil, the tranquil family ego, the society has to live in love and mercy. Sorry, I might back to this. But um, myth number three is that conflict is actually a function of dysfunction. <laughs> Let me say that again. Conflict is a function of dysfunction. No. Conflict is a healthy interaction. It is how conflict is approached that makes it healthy or not healthy. There are, unless Vinatala himself has says that no bear of any no bear of a burden will bear the burden of another. He makes it explicit that our individuality is something for us to own, to understand, to appreciate, because he himself acknowledges it for us. Whether we, got, we all came from one source, our prophet Adam alayhi salatu wa salam, but he recognizes us in our own individuality and recognizes our strengths as much as we understand our weaknesses. And he makes us know that in this, we would all sometimes struggle with one another because we are trying to listen to one another. And this is where conflict will begin to happen. However, how we approach conflict with build will decide whether or not this conflict will actually lead to resentment or if we are put to the lack of goodness, Bill is what will make it. Um, so if we are put to the lack of Bill, is what will make it lead to resentment. Or if we are put it with Bill, goodness is what will make it lead to an understanding of how much of our individuality is a unique one in raising a tranquil family and a tranquil um, society, having a tranquil society. The fourth myth here talks about appearance equals. Um, reality. So in this new world, new age of having um, filters, so you go on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, wherever it is you go, all those things, oh, mashallah, couples goals, mashallah, family goals, you see people showing up, good things as well, like, these are good examples, you know, that we should strive for. However, there are very few people who show up authentically, even in their imperfection, to say, well, these are some of the things that we're struggling with. These are some of the things that we are trying to work through. This is the progress that we've made. And alhamdulillah, this is how far we've come. And we are working towards that, mashallah. So appearance doesn't necessarily equate reality. In fact, what dysfunction tells us that the more you try to hide your imperfection, the more the dysfunction in that family continues to persist in that. And then the fifth um, myth of dysfunction is that only extreme behaviors are dysfunctional. It is only that person that shouts that is dysfunctional in the family. And the person that stonewalls or puts, um, that is always quiet is not a dysfunctional human being. But that is also showing you what we have taught to think to be dysfunctional. Dysfunction is not just something that would easily manifest. The functional can, both ha can happen in both subtle and extreme ways. It can show up with the person who is trying to manage their anger. It also shows up with the person who is even struggling to fully connect in their families. Dysfunction can be inherited is another myth. So if you come from a broken home, it is likely. So if it's a broken home in this balance between if you come from a family where um, your parents were divorced or separated at one point in time, it is likely that you will repeat the same cycle of, break, um, of separation or divorce. No. 
In fact, it is more possible if it is attended to that people who come from dysfunctional backgrounds to learn, particularly to learn what went wrong if it was attended to the way it should and, um, and the learnings were put to good use for them to raise more functional families than people who have never experienced dysfunction or seemingly understood what dysfunction is in their family life. Because the reality is that while family patterns can be learned, individuals can break them, choose to break the cycle if they pay attention with awareness and intentional efforts towards positive change. So here, Allah says again that he has created us from water, a human being, and made us related, line, related by lineage and marriage. So it is understandable that our very yearning as Muslim is towards having that home. Um, from the moment a child is born into the family, I, I handle it like if the, if the child is born into a family where there is conscious effort to raise the bar of salam, to raise the bar of sakina in that family, the child continuously wants to learn to build such a family as they are growing up, to continuously be in that same family and to express that in his or own unit family as they are growing up. But expanding our need for our consciousness for a family is understanding that there's a philosophy to relationships and all that it carries. There is a process to relationship and we need to show this to our children because this is what will determine how well they also begin to raise their own children. And then by that, we begin to see the ripple effect, which of course translates into the society. In fact, if you're more conscious of your own peace and tranquility in your family, you begin to attract people of similar minds into your conclave. And before you know it, you begin to expand that consciousness into the society as it is. So what are the patterns of dysfunction? In what ways can we begin to see the different um, ways that dysfunction shows up in the society? One of the most popular ways is the cultural dysfunction, which of course comes that um, we have mixed religion, we have mixed um, the deen, the akida, the understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah with our cultural expectations. And some, in some cases, it is pretty difficult to, dis to distinguish the two. And what you more often find as norm in some families that they would translate as a, as a religious reason or as an Islamic reason for doing certain things may not even have its basis in Islam as much as it has a basis in their cultural understanding. And this in itself would continuously irk new generation Muslims who are beginning to fight, fight a lot more than our parents did. And they will ask you, why are you doing this? Why do you think this is important? Oh, why, where did this idea come from? And if you're unable to defend those dynamics in your family, you begin to see how this play up as, um, oh, some people have more akida than some people. And you begin to see the disintegration in the family as a result of not having a cohesive understanding of why we do things, either culturally or even on, this, on the basics of Islam. Social um, patterns also show up especially with new age families who fit into the pop culture definition of what a family is. And I speak carefully of this in this new age where we find um, the trends of migration, parents are living far apart. We have more single, um, single parent families than we used to have in the, in, in the total, early 2000s and, in, and in the 90s than we do right now. And this fast paced, um, slow reasoning world is infiltrating into our values as Muslims. And it is seemingly making it difficult for families to be united in their vision or in their expectations of one another. The other way that the patterns of dysfunction also shows up in faith is as fatwa. And I do not, and I say this very carefully when I talk about how Muslim clerics also not rising to the occasion of the current needs of this hustle society, hustle culture society, where our, where our younger generations need more clarifications than we, I mean, while we were growing up, all we needed to hear was that the Afar said this, 
and it was okay, and we went and we went ahead with it. But if the new age, with this new age generations, they need more clarification. They need solid proof. They need evidences. And some of our clerics and, and Muslim organizations are not rising up to that location. And sometimes even in the in our bazillusness to say this is what the slab says, we hurt families who are struggling to even become more Islamically conscious, more faith conscious by the proclamations that we made on the member. And this, of course, drives them, there's a wedge between what is expected of them as Muslims and what is expected of them as humans. And so we have more people, uh, younger generations saying things like, you know what, you know, I, I am subhanAllah, I know Allah is one, um, but Allah knows my heart and that's all that matters. So every other thing that comes with Knowing Allah is one, all the five pillars of Islam, are just, I mean, all the other four pillars are just by the way in that sense. And these are things that we need to begin to pay attention to. And then the last one is trauma and how trauma presents. I know that one of my favorite, one of my amazing sisters have talked about trauma and how it presents, but trauma also actually inflects into the patterns of dysfunction because from cultural to domestic and the invasive, invasive and the vicarious traumas, we begin to understand that what people think, or the adverse experiences people have had over time actually begin to live with them and begins to decide on desi and design what they believe, how they react, what they, how they interact with, in their relationships. Even with all their well-intentioned and well exposed and, and clear exposure to what the dean expects of them. Because trauma plays its role, it affects their reasoning and which in turn affects their behavior. And of course, this begins to manifest in the results that we see in the society. So what are the presentations of dysfunction? And I think some of us know this, particularly because this is the topic that we've chosen for us to discuss. And the most popular one is toxic family relationships. Toxic family relationships are in its various styles and forms. Basically it speaks to the fact that People, members of a particular family are unable to relate on the basis of those two tools Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in Surah room, love and mercy. There is the projection of um, past trauma. There is a continuous projection of resentment. There is the generational um, misunderstanding that comes from one generation. I yeah, from this particular family tree and we don't speak to that particular, particular family tree because of what this particular family tree did to us. Our family relationship also shows even in smaller units where you begin to find that the way the father relates to the mother is so painfully obvious that it is filled with um, a lack of goodness. There is no hell in it at all. And you want to correct it, but you are culturally forbidden to interfere or to investigate or to uh, intervene because of what it is. So we continue to allow this to go to faster and faster. And then the children grow up to think that this is the natural way a family should be. And of course, they also continue to procreate the same toxic family relationships. Now, the second presentation is in the digital overdrive. More and more, we are seeing families spending more time on their devices from as soon as the child can have a can speak, the child can have a tab, can have a phone, can have the screen to him or herself. And in this digital overdrive, we are seeing families moving apart, communicating less. In fact, we have more housemates than we have more soulmates in the family. And this, of course, begins to show us just how much dysfunction we are thinking is normal these days. It also presents as faith erosion. So the things that we find value in as our iman, in understanding that community relationship is really important, in understanding that you know, going to the masjid on Friday as a man is an obligation, and going to the masjid as a woman on Friday is, is, um, is not necessarily an obligation, but an invitation to connect with more people. And that has been overwhelmed by, eh, well, 
All I know is that I tried to preach Juma on Friday, so he will forgive me. What I can do is the trial and you know, everything will be forgiven and all that. Our faith is constantly eroded by the decisions that we are now making as unit families and as individuals, which of course is actually beginning to show in our society, because in Surah Total, like Allah said it, in, in this that um, that is the command of Allah, which he has revealed to you, that he, whether he's careful to the duty of Allah, he will definitely make their way. He will remove from them evil. But for those that decide that they're going to go their own way, you know, they would see the manifest error in their ways, whether in this world or in the hereafter. So um, another presentation is social injustice. Of course, one of the three questions and one, I'm sorry, three things and one question is understanding that whatever injustices happens in the family, in, sorry, happens in the society actually began from the family. Because as much as we are crying that our governments in various countries are not doing what they are supposed to do, um, we are been crying here, um, we have been crying blood and water over the crisis in Palestine, we have been asking a lot to intervene, the, and we've been saying so many things, all the political injustices oh, that we've been seeing in the world that have been manifesting is as a result of what exactly are you teaching in the family front? What exactly is most popular within your family system? How exactly are you teaching justice and fairness and equity in the family system? Because every one of our world leaders, none of them were created out of vacuum. They all came from a family. And if the family is the most important Okay, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving it away. If the family is the most important part of the society, it should tell us what exactly we need to begin to pay attention to. No communication and emotional skills. And this is it, because we live in a high fly society where demand is overwhelming, the demand for you to be, to do, to have is overwhelming, the demand to become and to being is low. The awareness to being, the awareness to becoming is rather low. So what we are having are individuals who are constantly edgy and you know, um, combative, as opposed to individuals who are patient enough to evaluate and to reflect and it's one a lot. And most of the most important surahs of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will often end it with afala alone. do you not reflect? Or he asks questions like, um, which of the famous of our young Lord will you deny? Again, bringing us to that position of constantly reflecting on his words, that he has given you stories upon stories of people from the people of Ad to the people of um, Egypt, for you to constantly see what their end was, so that you can be in a position to not just demand for be, do, have, but to access, uh, to appreciate your sense of being and your sense of becoming in the way Allah SWT has created it. And this you will see in how we communicate to one another. So the parent that shouts on the child today is expecting that same child to be a very respectful and being to the sibling. And that sibling and, the, and those children will grow up and go outside and meet other children and they become bullies. Where did the bullying come from? It came from the family. And if we do not understand the basis of that, it is this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us emotions as gifts. Now, every emotion is an information, it is a messenger. And how we choose to interpret that message is how we learn to regulate our emotions, which in turn would affect our communication. So if we don't begin, if we don't begin to pay attention to what our emotions are informing us, we will begin to lose touch with what we are saying and what we are demanding. And that of course will begin to affect our interaction. And of course, all this will inform what we now see as the norm lately, domestic violence. Now domestic violence does not just happen between husband and wife these days. We are even seeing the uprise, the uptake in the domestic violence between children and their parents. 
children who are choosing to defend themselves, like, I am not going to take this from you again, right? And they're actually into that combative, physical combative mode of defending themselves. And this is what they are now beginning to deal with now. So after all is said and done, what do we need to do? Um, I have this favorite scholar who says that everything is Surat al Fatiha and Alhamdulillah, I love the fact that we actually started with Surat al Fatiha. Everything in Surat al Fatiha is actually both a prayer and an, injunction, and an injunction. It informs you and it prays for you. And for me, that is informative because when you say, when you praise Allah, you will acknowledge his mastery over everything that is happening around you. And when you seek of him, from him, your, um, when you seek from him help, you are also acknowledging your humanness. And this is where faith lies. So for me, there are three things that we need to do as Islamic psychologists, therapists, activists, community organizers, Muslims, family and folks, enthusiasts, um, family members. They lie in three things, faith, knowledge, action. One does not work with the other, right? And I love this quote by one of my beautiful sisters who says that, you know, and it goes back to Surat Ravum, when love fails, because love is an emotion that we think at some point we can run out of. When love fails, and this is Allah in his mercy, saying trigger mercy, right? When you feel like, you know, you've been in the situation for so long and you're overwhelmed by the feeling of being dismissed, being disapproved and nothing is working the way it should, go back to that space of mercy. Seek mercy from the owner of mercy, the mercy for himself, and then begin to live with mercy. And this actually begins to show in how you interact with your family members. This begins to show in how you're compassionate with people that I may have wronged you in the past or people that you're living with or even yourself for the errors that you have made before. Because if you are not compassionate and you're not able to forgive yourself, it is very difficult for you to repair your relationships. So when love fails, trigger mercy. So work with faith because parenting, loving in fear, you know, I mean, we are psychology students, so we are most likely understand what the attachment style is. One of the most dangerous type of attachment is the anxious attachment. Because in anxiety, you would find such an adrenaline that you don't even think that, you didn't even think that you had before. Because in that anxiety, I do not want to lose this love, I do not want to lose this love, you could choke the love of what is existing. And that is one of the things that is most dangerous when you are parenting too, because you don't want your child to turn out, but you are focusing so much on, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want. He forgets that faith is important. The last one I tell her, who is the master planner of all our fears? Who is the best disposer of all our fears? Is existing. And if you pray to him and you do what you need to do, that Allah will turn the affairs of yourself and your children in the best way, no matter what the world is saying. So begin with faith. Then acquire knowledge. Provide explicit, robust family curriculum. It is not enough for you to think that you're sending your children to madrasa or you're sending them to school. You have to be invested as a student of life yourself and their teacher of faith themselves. The things that they would need to learn about approaching faith, approaching loving Allah, they will most likely love, they would most likely learn from the home first before they begin to listen to one um, Islamic cleric outside. And then the third, which is also indisputable, is action. You have to be the model that you are so much wanting to see in the world. Before we begin to attack whatever society leader out there, let's ask ourselves, how much of the work have we put in, first and foremost, so that we can actually be the change that we are hoping to see in the future. And at the end of the day, it boils down to this. SubhanAllah, when I, um, I had a concern, um, when Rasulullah was, was, was explaining that every person is a shepherd and you'll be made to account. So as much as you are thinking that the father of the family would account, 
The question is whether you are the mother of the family, what do you need? What are you going to account for? And you as the child of the family, what exactly are you also going to account for as well? So you have to understand really what is expected of you and to begin that journey holistically to say, if I want my family to represent the society right now, or if my family was going to represent the society, what kind of society is it right now? Is it one filled with tranquility or one filled with toxicity? So um, this is my um, discussion, discuss with you and I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from you and I and forgives me for any error that I have made. And more importantly, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us to the best of works and works that will be most pleasing to him. Amen. Jazakum Lakhayan again for um for inviting me. Questions and comments. Jazakum uh, Lakhayan. Thank you for for being very economical with the time. Uh, please, uh, I would like to just have a <laughs> short commentary. Yes, uh, yeah, I will, we appreciate that actually, and the delivery is is, is, is very nice. This uh, sister Shahira, I want her to please give some commentary, please. Hey, Samuel, you from Slavakatu. Thank you, Sam Slavakatu. Thank you, Sam Slavakatu. For that amazing lecture, ma'am. Even though I came late, I had another session before this time. So when it like ended that session, I just had to come in. I didn't expect less, alhamdulillah. And I'm wild and I'm really grateful that you have been able to do this for us. I ask Allah to accept it from you and from us too. So I hope that every one of us have learned something new. And one of the things I think I, I personally will be taking away from here is that toxicity is not something that is just... From the myth of toxicity uh, of normal that we learned in the in the in the slide so far, it's not something that is just dysfunction that we see. Maybe the person that is always shouting. Even those of us that think that we are calm, we are not always everywhere. We have our own, and we need to start looking and evaluating from our own family lens. Look at your own family, your immediate family, and try try to pick out the points relating to what we have learned here today. That okay, I think I have this tendencies too. I think this is what she was saying, and all of that. Because at the end of the day, it's not about just listening to these lectures. It's about how we are able to look, point back to our own self. It's very easy for us to point at other people and see the fault in other people. Ah, I'm more and more. But those of us that understand the Yoruba, we say, ah, that's the child of a cleric. See the way she's dressed. We are judging her already. She doesn't use the hijab. We are seeing all of that. And yet, we see those that are using the hijab too, the full hijab. And yes, they still commit some sins that we know that are not right in Islam. But because we don't see them, we judge those that we see. So let's look at it. I think that's very common for us in our own climb in Nigeria. We are so quick to judge people, especially when it comes to the addressing. Each of us, we are struggling and we are on this journey together. And I think that's one of the points she raised in the aspect of us seeing that, no, it's about what we, appearance is what we used to judge people. And the, we used to judge what is normal or what's not normal. May Allah is it for every one of us and forgive us for whatever mistake we have made here. Thank you very much, ma'am, for, for honoring our invites. Barakallah, Fiki. So I think I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I can see somebody's hands up. I can't hear you. Should Sister Fatima go ahead and ask her question? Okay, oh, Fatima, sorry, sorry. I, I don't know how I was, my mind was muted. Yes, please, you should go ahead and ask her question. Sister Fatima. Hi. Hi. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. We can hear you. Yes, sir. I just want to add the speaker that how best can a mother control her, her anger when dealing with her children? Most of the time, I yarn, shout. At the end of the day, I, I always regret my actions, but I can't help it. That's what I'm trying to speak up for. No, Stamina, do you want to... 
Yeah, just a question for um, sharing with vulnerability, your struggle on this parenting journey. And I tell you that you're not alone on this particular journey because part particular for us who have been raised by African parents or raised the African way, managing our emotions is one of the things that we find most difficult. And here is the thing. Um, emotions are natural things. Emotion regulation is thought. While emotions are very natural for us to feel all these emotions, the um, happy, sad, angry, fear, surprise, um, disgust, emotion regulation is actually taught. And a lot of the times what has happened over and over again is that we've seen parents who are dysregulated also raising children who become dysregulated and then the pattern continues and continues and continues. So one of the first things you want to do is to assess yourself. How were you parented? Um, were you shouted at? Were you also yelled at? Were you constantly derog derogated and you know dismissed or disapproved based on what you've done? If that was the case, then you already have the um, you already have the um, what this called the prerequisites to not be able to regulate your emotions. And for you to regulate your emotions is for you to understand your triggers. What are the things that trigger you? There are some people that it is not the that they don't understand a baby would cry, but they will get triggered by tears or the cry of a baby because when they were children themselves, adults were there telling them keep quiet. Why must you cry? So in their mind, they have actually translated the meaning, the meaning of tears of crying to mean something that is wrong. But when you are in pain, you will cry. When something hurts you, you will cry. When you need some, when a baby needs something, the only language they can muster at that moment in time is to cry. So when you are feeling like you're constantly shouting, you want to ask yourself, exactly how exactly have i been taught to shout now what are exactly are my triggers to shouting oh i need my children to be able to do this and if they are not able to do that now limits so i can do it in a day and begin to regret and I'll come to take a walk and tell my children, give me, give me five minutes and come back and ask me so that I can be able to respond to you better. What you're doing right in that moment is what we call pattern interrupt. You are actually learning to interrupt your own pattern of trigger response, trigger response, to trigger force response. And then you'll be able to learn how to respond more effectively rather than shouting to every um, issues that your children bring up family. But for more information, I think you can, because this is something that you actually need to actively learn to do better. I think you should reach out to um, a therapist. So I mean, why yeah, I don't know, but uh, I think we lost yes. him. I don't know. Are you here, sir? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. He's here. Yeah. yeah. I th there was a question in the chat also that I want to read up from Fauzia. Please let me look for it again. I saw it. Okay. 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 She said. Okay. You want to read it already? Okay. You want to read it out? You can go ahead. I just. I'm just okay. Said. So how do you identify toxic family re relationships? Uh, is it possible to have it toxic with your children? We have more housemates than a, no. She's trying to refer to you as a statement during the lecture that we have more okay. housemates than a soulmate. So how do we get out of this? That's that's the main question. She's basically okay. talking about I the toxic just, family. Yeah. So okay, this way. Toxic relationship. Yeah. Um, toxic. Yes, it is possible for you to have toxic relationship with your children. Hypervigilance, for instance, is one of the ways that some parents, um, what we call helicopter parenting. It's one of the styles of parenting that is toxic to a child's development. Um, one of the things that I try to teach my parenting classes is, to, is the understanding that you're not raising children to be children forever. You're raising children who will, be, who will become 
individuals who are well adjusted and responsible for the society. So if you are constantly meeting their demands as they are asking, if they are raising entitled children. So toxicity could also present as entitlement, for instance. So we have this um, new age entitlement, entitled generations, and we are asking ourselves, where did that come from? Well, here's the thing. Insolence without, I'm sorry, compassion without boundaries leads to insolence. There are two types of um, entitlement, right? One is insolence, one is um, one is, one is disconnect, disconnection. So in, compassion without boundaries leads to insolence. Boundaries without compassion leads to disconnection. And these are the two types of ways that entitlements are formed in the family. So this is another type of toxicity in the family. So toxicity is not just when you're shouting on a child or you are constantly yelling on a child or you're feeling the inability to love your spouse um, the way you should love them, right? It is understanding that even in your well-intentioned bubble to do differently, you could be harming if there is no balance, and we are in a nation of balance, right? Alas, one of the tellers, and alas, one of the that he has enjoyed good for us and made us to forbid um, bad. So we have to find the balance and from those excesses. Compassion without, uh, thanks, thank you, Star Shakira. Compassion without boundaries leads to insolence, boundaries without compassion leads to disconnection. And these are some of the toxic experiences that some, pe some people have in their family. Um, the second question, we have more housemates than soulmates. How do we get out of this? I think my last slide captures this perfectly in terms of, again, going back to what Sister Kudrat's Laurel Additional said, when love fails trigger messy, sometimes you would, in their faces in your relationship with your spouse, there's, this, there's a particular face where it is so difficult for you to be together because you're so used to each other and you're unable to understand why this person just hasn't changed or why this person has changed so much and are living consciously apart. In that moment, this is where Alaswana Tala has instructed mercy, trigger mercy in that, in that place. So I pray Alaswana Tala makes that easy for him. All right, thank, thank you very much. Uh, do we have another question? You can raise up your hand, you can send the chats. Okay, because I actually have a, a maybe like a an hypothesis to present to you, more like a question as well. So I read <laughs> I read a book um maybe a few years back on the, the walking Quran. It's written by um, Professor Radov Item. He, he has a case study about. Uh, children in his, his studies are about uh, uh, studying Quran in Senegambia area, and he talks about um, the mode of teaching, which is the style of corporal punishment. It was one of the things that he mentioned there. Now it's a bit, it is a little bit uh, maybe off our topic, but you know, terbia like growing kids is part of family upbringing, of course. Yes, and, it does. And we know that in Africa we use we, we have this approach of corporal punishment when we try to discipline our mm. kids. Now, another scenario, like I was listening to someone, I was like, oh, we need to change our parenting in Africa. If you go to the West, uh, they don't beat their kids, yet they know how to talk to them and they listen to them. So I reflected deeply about it, two scenarios. And I look at the end goal, the parents, of those whites and the blacks, or let me say Africans, or let me say blacks. Mm. In the end, there is more attachment to the parents of those parents that receive corporal punishment, so to say. But in the West, we find out that in the end, they don't attach their parents. They leave them for homeless homes and they prefer to leave them. The attachment is not there. Like, I mean, when in Africa, you always want to come back home. You have this attachment to your old people, older people, like in the West. I mean, that it maybe things are going changing now. So it might not be the corporate punishment that is, uh, I'm saying that it's effective here, but I, I want to say that maybe there is something that is peculiar about Africa that we also need to identify. So my first question is, what do you think about corporate punishment, number one, and what is that dysfunction in the West? Even though we praise their 
not using the corporal punishment approach. So what is mm. missing such that the kids, when they grow up, they, con they disconnect from their parents? Unlike in the Africa, they would like to take care of their old, older, uh, most times, older uh, parents. Mm. So what can you say to these uh, scenarios? And what do you think about corporal punishment generally? Okay, so I think, um, let me rephrase the question. What you're asking me is that in both scenarios, in the West where there is um, a lot of compassion, like I've mentioned, yeah, yeah. Um, there's no immediate attachment to the family or the need to come back to the family. There's a yes. lot of independence. Yes. And in the, well, in the African continent where we have a lot of corporal punishments, mm -hmm. you know, signifies quote and unquote boundaries, a form of boundaries in itself, yes. mm -hmm. there is more attachment to the home. Mm -hmm. um, I think I would go a third route, which is if you study the aborigines, mm -hmm. um, they, they are the most raw form of humans, to put it very plainly, that we have existing in the aborigines in Australia, where you have mm -hmm. more people living in the Amazon areas and you know, and mm -hmm. all that, they are not dissuaded by digital toxicity mm -hmm. or um, urbanization or anything. Yeah. Their raw essence is living as plainly as they are born. Like the Bedouins. Mm. Yes, like the Bedouins. And you know, the interesting thing is one of the studies that um, I um, went through in understanding the terbia of the Prophet and the way the Bedouins were often um, child carers mm, for yeah. a certain age of yeah. children of elites um, in, the city, they take them to, no. in the city. They will take them into the desert to foster. It's mm. interesting to see that the one thing that these people have is the communal parenting or the communal process of parenting that mm. actually attaches compassion with mm. clear boundaries and resilience and understanding of values and expectations. Mm. So at a particular age, a child is expected to be able to- um, Do certain things. To do certain things. Meanwhile, if you, so again, going, taking it back to your question, the Westerners are like, eh, well, the child will learn whenever the child will learn. There is no boundaries. Or to our own African parenting style where it is all, you must, even when the child is struggling, even when the child's learning process is different than the norm, you begin to label and judge, which of course begins. Now, what you have seen or what you have said so far, <clears throat> is to say, what, what, what I've learned by is to say that even when children come back home, they come back home out of duty, out of obligation, not out of compassion, because it is expected. Mm -hmm. What you now see is that these very people that are coming back home to take care of their parents, I'm not even sure that their own children will come back home to take care of them. Because if it was working, if, all, mm -hmm. if the parenting that they received was working, they would replicate it with their children. Yeah. But they go abroad and then they forget about how the African parenting was working. Because it wasn't working. And so for me, it is always coming back to the therapy of the resource so I'm in understanding that there is balance. There has to be balance. Boundaries does not have to exist. I mean, look at the life of the Rousseau. He had children. No way in the Hadith or in the Seal were we told that he beat any of his children. Look at the way he even speaks to Fatima Wadiyalawaniya in the way that you would wonder what kind of father-daughter relationship is this? It made you yearn for that kind of relationship because you wanted to just, and it wasn't a world leader who was so engrossed in leading the world that he forgot his family. So it is about understanding that, number one, compassion is, faith is the basics, faith, faith is the base of the pyramid. Um, and it is the peak of the pyramid. In between it are the ingredients for understanding, the ingredients for love, the ingredients for peace, the ingredients for attention and affection and everything that comes in between. 
okay. in that sense. And these are the things that you will find in people who choose to live outward of the civilization. In fact, in our own world history as Africans, we did not use to beat. We did not learn how to beat until we were enslaved. Because the black man told us that the only way for you to correct a black, the only way for you, and the white man told us the only way for you to correct a black man is for you to train him like an, um, a cow. So we learned that and we began to translate that into our parenting journey. Lo and behold, we haven't changed. And may Allah forgive us. Um, okay, so thank you. What I also what I got now is in the two scenarios, there are two extremes. So yes, yes. It's too much freedom and you must uh, abide by the norms of the culture on the other side. So maybe there is, can be moderate moderate uh, parts which is the third party too uh, and which is following the therapy of the prophet um, they will be able to to replicate that thank you very much it's been a wonderful session and if there is any that, um, i think okay. there's somebody asking could i explain okay. what when love feels trigger mercy, trigger mercy does yeah. it mean that when love feels that you use mercy it's, yes it is that you use mercy you approach whatever issue it is because sometimes when we love someone it is very easy for us to be blinded to their weaknesses or their struggles and to say oh well this person will get better because we love that person however when love begins to fade or begins to fail we need to begin to attach that compassion of saying well this person is only human they are doing the best they can based on what they know. Perhaps if they know better, they would do better. That is one. Or on the other hand, for your own peace of mind, seek mercy and ask Allah to increase you in patience. Because again, patience and perseverance are the two swords that Allah has defeated the believer. And may Allah make it his fault. No. Thank you very much. Uh, this, uh, maybe if, if we don't have a question again, uh, I want to ask Dr. And I, I really, if I wish we have uh, something to do, like a round of applause for her, for the wonderful session, <laughs> and the reward you for, for the beautiful session you have given us. It's a beautiful uh, gift. And we, inshallah, we have a token of um, certificates of appreciation, which I'm going to share to you throughout our conversation. To show our appreciation for, for this. Uh, I mean, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity and the kindness. Yeah, thank you so all in goodness. Amen. And we're looking forward to to do more with you. To we hopefully we'll inshallah. get in touch with you, in, and we hope that you'll be available to attend to us. Inshallah. I would like to invite Doctor Muhammad if he's available to just give us a closing remarks. Well, um, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity and thank you, Dr. Samia, if I am right. Dr. Amina. <laughs> Dr. Amina. Dr. Inshallah. Okay. <laughs> okay, no, no, very and thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, in fact, uh, I I decided to keep the vigil over the no. topic because I it's right now here one fifteen. Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. So speaking to us from Malaysia, I decided to, uh, to to keep the vigil over the topic. The topic uh, is fascinating. Um, however, there are two very quick points that I would like to but trace uh, in between your presentation um, that is uh, it is very good and important that you start with the family build up as a, as a cornerstone of the society and the community and the country as a whole however um, we have to uh, we we all believe that um, the building up of family necessarily starts from individuals so uh, we cannot rule out the role of individuals and hence uh, the, the individual terbea and the individual 
education and upbringings. And uh, that is uh, one point. And uh, then the other one is um, comparing the uh, the Western life to the Islamic uh, style of life or to our local or traditional life, let's say that. Uh, what I see and what I observe there, uh, having lived both uh, simultaneously, is that um, the okay. case of the case of timely and untimely freedom. You take my hand back and everything. Let's go ahead. Okay, so the case of uh, uh, if I can use the, uh, the 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 term of timely and untimely freedom. So in the uh, in the case of Islamic uh, training and education, although we have uh, so there is a exemplary uh, uh, samples for us in the Prophet and then so however. So when we, we are we really following that exemplary characteristics of the Prophet when upbringing our children. So uh, even we that we live in a kind of what we call civilized environment. So are we following those uh, exemplary characteristics of the Prophet? So now we tend to give the children untimely freedom. Untimely freedom. Uh, because a child necessarily does not become matured when he be, when he or she becomes 18 or 19 or so to say. So I have not, uh, that is uh, the rigidity. That is what we call rigidity in uh, in the terms of our own parental upbringing back home in Africa society. Even if a child is 18, 19, 20, uh, the parents consider him under, the, the, under their tutelage. So this is not so in the Western society. So, and I, I, I think we need to dissociate uh, or differentiate between timely and untimely freedom. So only when we do that, then we will be able to be, maintain a uh, moderacy, the wasatiya that is that Islamic uh, education and terbiyah teaches us. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enrich us with more knowledge and opportunity to do that. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Sister Amina, for your time and for your knowledge, uh, for your wealthy of experiences in this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to make it and put it in your mizan al-asana. Jazakumullah mm -hmm. al And thank you also, uh, my dear uh, Abdul Aziz, for always keeping the good uh, work and the rest of the team, uh, uh, I, 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 I don't know how to mention. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always, always keep, keep you all uh, well uh, and uh, healthy, worthy, and sound in intellect and uh, in health. So uh, this is uh, the, the little I can say. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me of misthinking and uh, uh, misrepresentation. Jazakumullah khairan. And thank you all the attendees. Jazakumullah khairan for your times and your contribution. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for your insights. And inshallah, I'll be closing this will be official, officially closing the program. And I thank you all for attending. So I say subhanakallah wa alhamdi. Wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum Subhanahu wa ta'ala wa alaikum 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 wa ala